so as I say, to, uh, to finish the session, we wanted to use our talk to illustrate some of those common challenges of paleo GIS as they apply to our doctoral projects, uh, both of which are broad sort of scale projects based on dispersal. They contrast to some of the projects we've seen uh, today which deal with that sort of scale in that ours were kind of like just, just you know, one person operations compared to some of these very impressive uh, multi-person scale uh, projects that we've seen today. Um, so we're sort of uh, making it up on our own a little bit. Uh, and a lot, of those, a lot of those problems came out of that, actually. So my project was based on trying to assess the earliest occupation of Pleistocene in Central Asia, while Penny's project focuses on the lower to middle Pleistocene record of the Aegean. Um, now, despite studying different regions of the world, uh, many of the methodological problems that we faced were the same. And I will illustrate some of these uh, issues using my doctoral project as a case study. Then I'll pass over to Penny, um, who will explain how these issues relate to her project and also give some of our thoughts on possible future directions. So the oldest widely accepted securely dated sites that we currently have in Asia are Dumanisi in Georgia at 1.8 uh, million years and Majuangao in China at 1.66 million years. But currently, the oldest um, site in Central Asia is no older than about a million. Uh, and this is very curious, because Central Asia is on roughly the same latitude as these older sites, and it's also uh, known as a migration route in later periods, the eponymous Silk Road. So the question was, why does Central Asia um, appear unoccupied in the early Pleistocene, or for most of the early Pleistocene? And I think, you know, the main issues creating this pattern could be taphonomic or a result of uh, investigation bias or possibly environmental as well. So I tried to investigate this by reconstructing some elements of the early Pleistocene environment and by doing a form of affordance analysis and also accessibility analysis. Uh, however, numerous problems presented themselves and these problems really sort of emerge, I think, as, as key considerations of paleo-GIS generally. Now, my key issues were threefold. Firstly, how to deal with variability in the coverage of the data and the preservation of the record. Secondly, how to deal with the spatio-temporal scale in the analysis, namely sort of time depth and continental scale. And thirdly, in understanding how to model and interpret patterns of hominin behaviour at those scales. Um, two major issues that both Penny and I had early on were related to data. So firstly, there was a lot of uncertainty about the necessary quality of, uh, of data and the minimum best practice. Uh, so for instance, how good does a proxy have to be, for instance? And secondly, we were uncertain about methodological solutions to uncertainty itself in the record, and also the best practice surrounding that. And really, uh, a lack of understanding about what constituted best practice for dealing with these issues meant that we had little uh, sort of support on which to base our own mapping modelling attempts. Now, the lack of data sites in my study region was a massive issue. There's only um, about five securely dated sites, and those were all clustered down in the southeast. And, you know, it's a huge area, huge piece of the continent. So I had to be quite careful about the kinds of analyses I used and the assumptions that those analyses made. But the issue of how good a proxy data set has to be became a big issue for me in particular in the use of climate data uh, when I was building my affordances surface in particular. So the only climate data I could find was uh, last interglacial, that world, uh, that world climb data that we've seen uh, being used in, in uh, the correct period. <laughs> so I was using it to try, and, um, to try and study a much earlier period. Um, and it was unclear to me really um, whether this data could be considered good enough uh, to examine those much earlier time periods. And ultimately the solution that we came up with that, um, for that was to average the climate data together and to normalise it to remove the absolute values. And I used literature-based arguments to justify the idea that the relative patterning of the climate was likely to change uh, only a little on that sort of scale. And it's still really unclear to me how far that argument can be taken, but um, I, I do think that best practice is easier to ascertain in later periods of archaeology because much more is sort of published in these areas and an explicitly theoretical discussion uh, about data use is already well established. Now, our premise for this session has been that the, uh, the much uh, wider spatio-temporal scale of paleo-GIS is the source for much of the unique difficulties 
uh, and questions about best practice and theoretical approach um, are hard to translate wholesale from those later periods for just that reason. Now, there's good reason to expect unique spatio-temporal factors are at play in Paleolithic GIS. Um, Paleolithic archaeology has always been closer in theoretical basis and methodological basis to geology. And the nature of the record is more akin to a geological one in its fragmentary nature and also the contexts from which uh, the material is recovered. So some forms of analysis used in later periods probably have a slightly different relationship to the Paleolithic record, or they may be of little or no relevance to human behaviour at that scale. So, for instance, the reconstruction of river hydrology from contemporary topography is a standard form of analysis, and I've been asked actually many times why I didn't do that for my sites in Central Asia. Now, firstly, the main problem is that all of the best dated sites in, uh, down in the southeast, they come from the lower sequences, where major rivers cut down into the lowest deposits, which are sometimes up to 100 metres deep. Um, therefore, it was, there's this sort of clear non-behavioural reason for such sites to be located along major rivers in the study region. And secondly, even within historical times, the major rivers have been known to change course after, for instance, earthquake, uh, earthquakes. Sorry. And it's clear that sort of such uh, analyses cannot really take account of such variability. <coughs> How we interpret hominin behaviour at these sorts of scales is also a problem that needs serious consideration, such as the issue of the role of the environment in determining hominin behaviour. Now, where research in later periods might be criticised for environmental determinism, um, this debate has to be uniquely considered for the Paleolithic. Now, perhaps ED might actually be our most parsimonious model for hominin ancestors. So what role should hominin agency really have in our models? I think it isn't totally clear at this time. Uh, my affordances approach to early Pleistocene Central Asia was primarily driven by environmental data and therefore it had to make certain assumptions about how hominins use resources in the landscape and how this would manifest behaviourally. Another area of hominin behaviour that becomes uh, ambiguous at these spatio-temporal scales is movement or mobility. And it becomes difficult to interpret the results of standard methodologies used in later periods such as Lee Scott's pathways. How exactly would a Lee Scott's pathway relate on a, on a multi-generational time scale? Uh, and I think this is especially important, actually, because sites that are considered broadly contemporary in the Paleolithic may have dates with extremely large error ranges. I used a, a form of accessibility um, that used cost distance to look at dispersal into Central Asia, but the cost surface I used was my affordance mapping, uh, so it predicted resource availability. And it rated movement through areas rich in predicted resources as less costly than movement through areas that were low in predicted resources. I didn't include topography in the cost distance because I reasoned that the scale of the analysis really meant that it didn't matter much whether an area rich in resources was uh, in a valley or on a hilltop. You know, the tendency over hundreds of thousands of years wouldn't necessarily reflect that. Uh, and that's what I reasoned, but I know that not everybody agrees with that, and it's still not necessarily clear what role topography would play at this scale of analysis. <coughs> So Paleolithic archaeology as a field has some very broad questions which are probably best explored through spatial analysis, by which I mean especially these questions relating to dispersal uh, and landscape use. And this has led to a recent research shift, I suppose, from purely site-centred spatial analysis to region-centred analysis in Paleolithic archaeology. Although, as we have seen you know, in our session today, uh, both approaches are useful depending on the research question that's being studied. But the difficulties in doing this research are compounded by the fact that the difficulties themselves can push people away from studying the more difficult questions or archaeological periods. Now, me and Penny are calling these the three temptations of Paleolithic GIS. Firstly, there's a temptation to follow the data coverage. For instance, if uh, no climate data exists for an earlier period, the temptation is to study a later period with better data coverage. Uh, secondly, there is a temptation of allowing the structure of data sets to condition the research questions. So, for instance, whether the environment is considered as a series of discrete patches of individual biomes or a continuous landscape of resources, I think that's fundamentally a data issue. But it does feed directly into how we imagine hominids to move around a landscape and how we will model them. Now, the third temptation <laughs> is to do spatial analyses that are easy to do or are a standard part of the GIS toolkit already. 
Now, all these temptations are relevant for researchers working in later periods as well, but I think they're especially pronounced for those of us who study the Paleolithic. They all draw research away from the research questions that are interesting from a Paleolithic perspective towards questions that are perhaps a bit easier to answer. And the net effect has to be a dampening effect on new discoveries as researchers focus on the known archaeological record and a dampening effect on the development of new methodologies as researchers focus on what is already known to be possible. Uh, I now pass over to Penny, who will explain how some of the same issues have been relevant in her own research in the Aegean. So, um, so my PhD research, which is in progress, uh, actually explores homing uh, movement and occupation patterns in uh, eastern and northeastern Mediterranean with specific fo focus in the Aegean area uh, during the um, early and, and middle Pleistocene. Um, so my hypothesis, my working hypothesis is that the Aegean was not a barrier during the early and early middle Pleistocene, but an extended terrestrial landscape uh, hosting favorable environments uh, based on Lecousse's paleogeographical reconstruction for the Aegean for the last past uh, uh, 400,000 years. Um, and I think that it is really important to assess the archaeological implications of this uh, paleo paleogeographical um, a reconstruction because the Aegean uh, as being part of eastern and northeastern um, Mediterranean, an area that has proved to be crucial for the survival and dispersal of several mammalian species, including hominins during the Pleistocene, was expected to bear valuable information about the initial colonization of, of Europe and these first dispersal events toward the west. But the, the lower Paleolithic narrative from this specific area remains surprisingly <coughs> poor. And this positive evidence has been associated uh, with active geomorphic processes that have been transforming the landscape since the Miocene. And these same processes have been also affecting negatively uh, availability, visibility, and accessibility of the lower and middle uh, Pleistocene archaeological and paleoanthropological material. So the aim of my research is, is dual, basically. First, to explore um, uh, possibilities of movement and occupation of hominins across this paleo landscape, and secondly, to develop, if possible, methodological tools in order to unlock information kept in this type of dynamic context, as is the Aegean. So I'm asking questions referring to larger scales and wider landscapes over which movement can possibly be observed uh, and conceptualized. Of course, there are important limitations here. Um, the most obvious one is that the environments and the topography of the now submerged landscapes are mostly unknown. Uh, also, specific, uh, specifically for the Aegean, we have a, a, a problematic material due to the fragmented nature of available data in archaeology, paleoanthropology, but also in paleoenvironments, um, paleotopography, uh, etc. And also, we have temporal limitations with a vast majority of data going as far back as the last glacial maximum and not um, rarely beyond that. Um, and of course, it's the dynamic character of the landscape itself. Uh, it's still changing. Because of these limitations that are inherent in our material, we selected methodologies that actually rely mostly on um, current data sets, uh, basically the complex topography concept as introduced by Bailey and King. Um, so I'm using, and also uh, archaeology and spatial analysis as the two main pillars in my methodological approach. So the complex topography concept is used here um, as a background against which all available evidence in archaeology, paleoanthropology, paleoenvironments, etc., will be projected um, and syn synthesized. Now, the practical expression of the complex topography is uh, topographic roughness and the measurement on surface irregularities found uh, mostly on tectonic, on uh, actively te uh, tectonically active areas or areas with volcanic activity. Um, and GIS offers different uh, ways of measuring those regularities and topographic roughness. In, in my research, I've, I've uh, tried three different methodologies, topographic position index, deviation of mean elevation and slope analysis. Um, and in my case, uh, topographic position index uh, worked better, uh, possibly because I'm working on a, a regional uh, rather than, um, sorry, larger scale. And this is in good accordance with uh, literature and also it captures roughness 
uh, more efficiently, even, even in areas with uh, low elevation areas. Also, uh, when we examined landscape roughness with other uh, landscape variables, um, and specifically in areas where the main topographic uh, patterns uh, remain in time, despite the action of uh, geomorphic processes, um, specific areas within the Aegean started to emerge as having an increased research potential, and also some ideas starting to emerge um, as the volcanic root hypothesis, as we call it, uh, which is the, the uh, south central corridor in the Aegean could be actually a corridor connecting uh, southwest uh, Turkey with mainland Greece. Now, in, in the very first attempt to bring in the archaeology factor, I just, just for the sake of testing, I used the least cost root analysis. Um, I used, I used it here, um, I used as origins and destinations uh, known lower Paleolithic sites from both sides uh, of the Aegean. Um, and I based my association, my, my associations in, in, in wide chronological similarities, uh, uh, suggesting the presence of hominins in the wider area during the wider time frame of, of my uh, study, which is huge, I know that, and this is one of the problems. Uh, so strict similarities, for example, in the archaeology of the sites are not uh, always very uh, easy to, to, to be drawn here. Uh, I'm currently working on a suitability model uh, on the basis of, of, uh, of fuzzy logic in order to explore the suggested favorable character of the exposed black Pleistocene landscape in the Aegean. I'm going to use multiple variables, um, but I'm going to focus on, on freshwater supplies. And because the evidence from the lower uh, Pleistocene is very poor, I'm going to use some of the last glacial maximum evidence as a, as a proxy here. So I've also selected the fuzzy logic because it, it, it talks about uh, possibilities rather than probabilities in terms of uh, favor, favorable environments, in my case at least. And this fits better with the fragmented nature of the Aegean material. Now, some, some conclusions from both our, our project is that basically four main questions are keep popping up. How do we deal with the continental scale of analysis with the depth and the temporal uh, with the time depth and the temporal limitations, the variability in preservation and the poor coverage of data over our study areas, and also how do we seek to uh, understand model and interpret homing behaviors? The unique nature of JS applications in Paleolithic context is actually reflected in those questions. And in our projects, we tackled some of the issues by using several different concepts and methodological approaches, such as affordances, accessibility, complex topography, fuzzy logic, averaging and resampling of data in order to explore, study, and understand, at least in a first order, homing and mobility over wider landscapes. This is a process of testing and combining methods and GIS tools within lower Paleolithic contexts, with, uh, with, which represents a relatively new research field, and in that sense, experimentation is it's part of the whole process itself. But what represents the best practice? Are there objective rules or guidelines that would guarantee the best practice of JS applications in Paleolithic archaeology? There are, of course, specific limitations related mostly with the GIS tools and their performance in incomplete and or fragmented data sets and low resolutions. Our project suggests that the best practice is actually tailor-made, depending each time on the research question, the availability of data, the nature of the data sets, and the selection of the appropriate tools to answer uh, the specific research questions each time. Uh, we do not have a definite answer here. Uh, we make suggestions, we discuss possibilities, and we develop possible scenarios that can offer some new insight in the ways we perceive, conceptualize, and study homing mobility over continental scales. As we mentioned before, GIS applications in Paleolithic archaeology is a new research area that needs to be enriched in a theoretical and practical level. As PhD students, we both um, uh, working uh, in, in this field. We have been confronting uh, with this lack of information availability and also with a lack of scientific interaction. Um, problems, limitations, and potentials need to be discussed, uh, reconsidered, and shared among practitioners. And we hope that this session is a first step towards this direction. Thank you.